Our next speaker, I am so proud to introduce Leah Halloran, an artist and educator who is an alumna from Saatchi and who has taught at Saatchi. We associate blueprints with architectural drawings, but Leah, as an artist and astrophysics enthusiast, uses the cyanotype technique for her extraordinary series, Your Body is a Space That Sees. Her prints pay long overdue homage to female astronomers depicting craters, comets, galaxies, and constellations. We heard a little bit about a book called Hidden Figures this morning, and I think the little I've gotten time to know Leah, she doesn't do things superficially. There's a depth of research and um, a, a interest in really discovering and understanding space and in relationship to art. So with that, I welcome Leah up onto the stage. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. I don't know anyone who'd want to be presenting after astronauts. So I just want to pre-apologize for not going into space. Um, so um, I am an artist, and you said an astrophysics enthusiast. So uh, what I thought I'd do is just start by talking a little bit about how I got to making artwork about science. So um, this is an image of a field trip when uh, one of my students, I'm a professor of painting and drawing at Chapman University in Southern California. And um, I teach... Now, I, I focus most of my teaching on interdisciplinary studies. So I, this is a field trip from a course called The Intersection of Art and Science, where my students spend most of their Fridays at the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is responsible for many of the missions that Deva spoke about. So all of the non-manned missions that we know about going to Mars were built and designed at JPL. So um, our students get to interact with designers, engineers, and they then collaborate and make work about these missions. So uh, one of my favorite field trips on the left is we rent out Mount Wilson Observatory and spend the night doing observational astronomy. Um, my beginnings of being interested in science started when I was 15 years old, and I was hired at a science museum in San Francisco called the Exploratorium. I don't know if any of you have been there from the Bay Area, but it's one of the most extraordinary places because it's like a hands-on playground. Um, and my first job uh, was actually doing cow eye dissections <laughs> at the age of 15, and I was, an, some, was called an explainer, so I'd walk around and ask anyone in the public if they'd be interested in learning about magnetism or lasers. And um, I think that, Thinking about this symposium, the combination of art and science, we've talked about how uh, in the Renaissance they were combined. I think most of us are consumers, interdisciplinary consumers of culture. And so for me, most of my interests combine many, many things. Um, so I started off being interested in science, but I went to um, undergrad at UCLA. And um, as Stephen mentioned, I came to Saatchi for a year, and at that time, I, uh, as a junior, I was um, double majoring in astrophysics, and I thought, maybe I'll go into science, and maybe I'll go into art. And actually, spending a year in Florence was what made me know being able to be in a studio all the time was that I was going to be an artist, but that perhaps I could use science as the subject matter for my artwork. So um, I went to went off to graduate school, and this is one of my very first little drawings that's very simple and very diagrammatic. And we talked a little bit about how visualization can be of great interest to scientists and be very useful. And I think this is, um, when I look at this, it's so simple and, and um, looking at how uh, I was reading about wormholes. But it's actually one of my favorite drawings um, that I have kept over the years because of its simplicity. So in graduate school at Yale, I got a book called um, Black Holes and Time Warps, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy by a physicist named Kip Thorne. And there was something about this book that was so exciting to me because Kip not just talked about you know, the theory of relativity and black holes and how exciting they were. But the, the way that he translated it made me think about the experience of science. And so this is from my MFA show at Yale. And um, this is one of my favorite photographs of Kip Thorne. And um, this was photographed in 
2014 by a photographer named Dan Winters for the cover of Wired magazine. So in, in um, 2000, this is when I was in graduate school at Yale, I was making work based on Kip's research. And it was about five years later that I was at a cocktail party and someone said, oh, Kip Thorne is here. So I eagerly went up and introduced myself. And I said, you know, most of my graduate work was made based on your research. And would you like to come over for a studio visit? And um, he said to me, uh, you know, came over and he, he told me that there was a young filmmaker, I'm, this is not paraphrasing, this is a quote, a young filmmaker was interested in making a movie about his science, but he needed someone to help sort of visualize these kind of strange and warped part of the universe. So I said, of course made uh, this little drawing. And I'm sure for the students, many of you have been told by your professors to keep your work really nice. This was made in a little moleskin and ripped out and then taken to Steven Spielberg for the movie Interstellar, which I had, yes, of course, I had heard of this young filmmaker named Steven Spielberg. And these were some of the um, very early drawings that um, Kip was using to talk about how black holes, warped space, time travel could be possible. Um, so uh, I've been collaborating with Kip for almost 10 years now, um, and we're working on a book called Warped Passages, I'm sorry, um, The Warped Side of the Universe, um, which hopefully we'll be publishing in the next year. And what's different about this book than um, I think most of the science books is I've made over 50 paintings, and the prose is all by Kip, but it's all going to be poetry. So again, we're looking at the way that experience can be offered to a general public. And the other, you know, Kip, when he talks about this book, he says that he's never written poetry except for his wife. And um, the, we decided that there would be one protagonist in this book, and that's my wife. And so the book has a real intimacy where Felicia is our time traveler, and it's used to, to offer the, um, the true nature of science, but in a way that also creates an intimate and experiential uh, relationship with, with the audience and the viewer. Uh, many of you have probably heard of LIGO and its discovery of um, the collision of two black holes that collided 13 billion years ago. Kip was one of the trochea of the three people who founded the LIGO machine, so it's really a, an amazing collaboration to be working with someone who, um, you know, you think about he's one of the greatest living scientists and what does he want to do? He wants to make movies and collaborate with artists because he's excited about translating science to the mass audience. So when I was in um, graduate school, I had the opportunity to spend a summer out in the Atacama Desert. And the Atacama Desert has some of the largest observatories in the world. And as a painter, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. Um, and so I, so I took a simple 35 millimeter camera and would set it up and leave the uh, the lens open for four to six hours. These are some of the very first ones, not very good. On the um, right, there's light leaks. And um, it was, you know, I'd never made, um, as a painter, I'd never really thought about making photographs before. But trying to come up with a way to translate this amazing opportunity, um, I, I thought, you know, I should try to find a way to document it. Nothing really came of this. I, I never exhibited these works, and um, I say this to the students who are kind of interested in something, but they don't know exactly where it's going to go or what it's going to be. And sometimes your, your work just takes time to gestate. So this was in 2000, and I never really did much of it after that. Went on to have some exhibitions. This was a show called The World is Bound in Secret Knots. Um, when I grew up in uh, the Bay Area, my father is... A scientist, but he's also a total water man. So I got my first skateboard when I was four years old, grew up surfing and skateboarding. And so this um, series, The World is Bound in Secret Knots, was a way for me to kind of explore the, my own experience of weightlessness. And so it was um, all of these female skateboarders with the boards and ramps removed to accentuate the physics of skateboarding. And uh, the paintings were quite large. I think the smallest one is five feet by seven feet. And essentially, after making this work, 
I felt. It was like two and a half years of painting. And then I kind of asked myself, like, what exactly was I trying to convey with this series? Was it the skateboarders? Was it the, fi was it the figures? And actually, it was the physics. You know, how could you represent movement in an elegant way that would also be personal? And, um, you know, like I said, I had continued to take long exposure photographs of the night sky, but really just as a hobby and never exhibited them. Um, and uh, one of the um, photographs that I had remembered was uh, Picasso's drawing of the bull, um, a long exposure photography uh, photograph. Um, one of a, a very, very incredible kind of accident um, is that when taking these photographs of the sky, the film I would use had 36 exposures. Do you guys remember film? It's this plastic stuff that used to go in cameras. Um, so this, when you're taking photographs that are four or six hours long and you need to take 36 pictures, it could take a very long time to you know, take your film and to be developed. So what I would do is I would make these kind of dumb little cartoons, drawing my name, recreating some of the very early didactic drawings that I had done. Um, and so that was in the year 2000. It was about f five, six years later after having that show of the female skateboarders that I asked myself, was there a better way to represent motion and energy? And um, I was having lunch with a friend. And you you'll notice in my a theme in my... In my um, in my work is really being able to be open to failure and um, taking risks and making things look, you know, maybe they look totally different. They take you down a track that you're not sure of. Um, but I was having lunch with a friend and I said to her, she said, what are you doing later? And I said, I'm gonna go to the skate park at night and I'm gonna attach a light to my body and skate in the dark. And it sounded so ridiculous and I had no idea what was gonna happen. And the um, resulting images um, is a series called Dark Skate. And they're all portraits of myself. So it's, it's like a haunting, it's a self-portrait. But I felt that these in more so actually represented the energy and nature of movement. And um, I've taken them and done um, different artist residencies in different cities. But I first started by doing them in places that I skateboard. I grew up skateboarding. Um, I s still love skateboarding and never stopped. And so this is uh, in Los Angeles. And then I did a series in different cities, Miami, Detroit. This is a beautiful old, um, on the right, uh, on the left, Michigan theater that um, was a great center of culture and an old opera house and is now a parking lot. Vienna. And um, currently a series called Passage that looks at all of the waterways in Los Angeles. And most great cities are built around water. Los Angeles um, you know, was built because we were able to take water from somewhere else. And so most people experience the waterway at 70 miles an hour on a freeway. And so this series looks at um, river runoffs and drainages and dams and people in places that are really incredible that but you just don't ever get to be there physically um, and so the way that these are taken is I attach a light to my body mostly on my wrist and I work with one to two phot photographers and we still use film and large format cameras and then the lens stays open for anywhere from six minutes to 40 minutes, depending on how light or dark it is outside, even if there's a moon out. And what's happening is that you're seeing, there's, the images aren't photoshopped, um, but you see where I went, but you don't see um, me because I'm moving so fast and the, it's so dark out. So there's kind of an illusion of um, that, that they're, you know, that they're taken in the, um, at dusk or dawn, but they're taken at, um, in the darkest situations possible. Um, so, a couple of the other things I want to tell you guys about are some uh, collaborations with other um, uh, architects and scientists. Um, a couple of years ago, I became fascinated by this discovery of this crystal cave in Mexico. And what was interesting to me about it was not that we had never found gypsum crystals, but the scale of them um, and the, the sense of time then made us reconsider our understanding of, um, of what they were. So I created a series of paintings about them. Um, this is uh, about eight feet by six feet, and there were oil paintings. And um, 
when I was in graduate school, I started to work with one of the architects there, Sarah Strauss. And when, when, I, when I started making these paintings, we were joking around about making a crystal chandelier together. And um, I like that um, when, when thinking about collaboration, one of the most important things is a sense of play. And so this really did come out of um, just trying to do something that was fun and different. And one of the rules that um, Sarah Strauss and I had was when we'd make something together, Together. If we went back in the studio the next day and it wasn't awesome, we would throw it away. And I think that that was a really important aspect of collaborating because in your, in your own studio practice, in your own work, whatever it is that you're doing, you have a kind of a certain way of knowing something and a certain sense of control that you really have to let go of when you're collaborating and you can make something that you would never ever think of. So um, Sarah took my drawing and built it in the computer in three dimensions. And then um, if you can imagine a box it flat and you unwrapped it, you might get a cross. So what we did is we took these, my crystals, and then unwrapped them and you get these really bizarre shapes. And this is our first very odd looking cardboard crystal. Um, and then we started printing them in um, different types of plastics to make our crystal chandelier. And after this, we really got excited about maybe trying to recreate the experience of being in this cave. And um, so these are the early models of um, the cave that we could possibly build. And using new technologies, everything that you're about to see was built on a table saw with three women over a summer. And this is an exhibition in um, Arlington, Virginia called Artisphere. And whenever Sarah and I work together, we go under the name Collider. And um, I think of it as like a, just like a playground, you know? It's, it's a way for me to do something new, to learn something, to push me out of my safe zone. Painting is such a solitary act that um, having the opportunity even to work with different photographers on dark skate, um, and especially to work with new technologies has been a really um, kind of exciting part of my practice. The, um, the, after working with Sarah, kind of consecutively, I was, creating this work for um, a gallery show in Los Angeles uh, called Sublimation Transmutation. And this series was based on the periodic table of elements. I was interested in how um, the periodic table could serve as a kind of um, general catalog of the natural world, but how could I combine it with um, parts of my own personal world. So the series, all, uh, the scale of this work is probably is very important. They're f about five feet by seven feet. And then you see on that far wall, um, the periodic table, and that's 108 different paintings, all infused with different uh, figures. And it was here that I kind of turned to uh, an interest in the history of science and how cataloging got us to know the things that we know. And um, the periodic table is something that you probably, everyone knows, you either love it or loathe it. Uh, you know, you've been forced to memorize it maybe in seventh grade. But it's, you know, in thinking about art and the grid, it's also something that we recognize as, um, as very important. And because my true interest is in astronomy, I turned to the Messier catalog of deep sky objects. And this is the kind of parallel to what the periodic table is to chemists, the, the Messier catalog is to astronomers. And Charles Messier was a, um, was a comet hunter. And he, in the 17th century, lived in Paris. He um, was looking for comets. And when he was looking for comets, it's the, it, the story goes that he either could not figure out the mathematics correctly or that someone gave him the wrong instructions. And he found this strange thing. It was a nebula. And he labeled it M1. He didn't know what it was. And he literally writes in his journal, this is to be avoided when looking for comets. And he goes on. He finds another irritating smudge. And he's so dramatic in his journal. And he goes on and on. And I think what's fascinating about this story is is not the um, is not the fact that he was looking for comets, but he was discovering galaxies 200 years before we even knew what they were, and. W 
Charles Messier then found, um, there's 110 of these objects in the catalog. Some of them he found, some of them he rediscovered based on someone else's notes. But what's all, what's, this is not just a kind of part of history, but if any of you have ever looked through a telescope and seen anything other than the moon, a comet, or planets, my, I would bet that you have seen a Messier object. Why? Because he had a tiny little telescope, and he was actually observing from a balcony in Paris. I imagine he, he's like covered in cigarette smoke, and there's a lot of, at that time, soot in the air. So these objects are still important because they're nearby and very close. So um, this is one of his drawings of um, a nebula, of the Orion Nebula, and a current Hubble image. So for this series, um, my series is called Deep Sky Companion, I went through the catalog and using Messier's drawings and a Hubble image, I painted each one of these um, deep sky objects on a piece of translucent paper. On the, um, on the left is my painting, and then on the right, instead of photographing it, I took it into the dark room and used it as if it was a negative to create its positive image um, as a kind of homage to the beginning of the difference between drawing and photography. So I had um, 110 pairs, so 220 pieces, and if you were to hang this on a wall in a grid, it's approximately 25 feet by 45 feet long. And um, Kip Thorne saw this in my studio and brought it to um, the attention of uh, Caltech. This is the astrophysics building at um, Caltech in Pasadena. It's an amazing architectural building designed by Tom Main. Um, and I was invited to present this work in this building. Um, on the left here is David Ross. He was a student of Tom Maines, and he um, owns an architecture firm called Friedrich and Fisher. And he was also responsible for designing the exhibition that uh, borrowed some of these amazing Caravaggio paintings from Italy. Um, and so David was my exhibition designer, and this is to give you a glimpse of the, the strange interior of this building. The, the way that Tom Main thought of the building was like a giant telescope. So if you can imagine like a shoebox and then you um, take a bunch of straws and put straws through them. There's different moments in the building where you can only see them from maybe a level below. So it goes four stories. And I had never made a, such an elaborate site-specific piece before. And we decided that um, instead of using the grid, that we would then cut the pieces into uh, discs which is like a minor heart attack after spending a year and a half making something. Um, so uh, this is uh, an image of our installation crew. Uh, one of your students, Lily, was also assisted us here. And um, the final installation goes four stories. So it's 110 pieces that... Um, that go through different parts of the building and there's different moments where if you're standing on one level you can kind of see something through so on the far left there you see that tiny little window in the building the experience of it is as reflection but it actually goes through to another room um, and so we tried to mimic this idea of telescopic viewing in, instead of the kind of regular experience of seeing an art piece where you would have a relationship to your body, you'd be able to get very close. Part of the experience of this, of this exhibition was that you could see things in that way, but there was also things that were a little bit far out of your reach and that you wouldn't ever be able to actually see them. And th making this work, it, it took several years to do. And I um, read a little story about, um, about another astronomer who made a very famous catalog, uh, William Herschel, and how his sister had, um, had assisted him. And it started getting me thinking, like, how many women in the history of astronomy um, have been, has served as assistants to their brothers, their husbands, their uncles? And um, I discovered this story that's, it's, sort of hidden in plain sight if you, um, I hope that you Google it and look up these women, but they were known as Pickering's Harem or the Harvard Computers, as Davis said before um, in the story of Hidden Figures, which has a film coming out. Um, women were um, doing mathematics and different computations and they were actually referred to as computers, human computers. So this is an image of, um, of the Harvard Observatory in the late 1800s. Um, 
there were a group of women that were hired by the observatory director named William Pickering, and um, he doubled his staff, uh, essentially by paying women less than half of the rate of their counterparts. And this, um, the, the show that I'm going to, um, the project that I'm going to show you now is called Your Body is a Space That Sees, and it's supported by a um, NEA grant, and it, it's in uh, four phases. So the first one is research. So I go back and forth to Harvard to, to look at the glass plate collection. So if you can remember film, before film in photography, there were glass plates. And actually, the very first image of the night sky was taken at the Harvard Observatory in 1852, and it's a tiny little daguerreo type of the moon. Um, and Harvard has the largest glass plate collection of astronomical objects in the world. And many of them were studied by these women that um, started working there in the late 1800s. And what's amazing about this story is that there wasn't just a few outliers. This was 20 to 40 women working in the observatory at once Oh, almost 40 years before even women had the right to vote in America. I mean, it's really an incredible, rich lineage of our history of astronomy. Um, and so what I've done is, I, looking at the collection, there's a, we've created this little cheat sheet. This is almost one of the only ways that you can figure out what they were studying, is to look for their initials. And um, the plates themselves, um, have little tiny clues in the notation or in the, um, the handwriting. So this is one of the plates that was studied by Annie Jump Cannon. And um, here she is labeling the uh, luminosity of different stars. And so um, similar to the Deep Sky Companion piece, what I've done is I've taken those plates, the ones that I can identify, to link to specific uh, discoveries by women, and creating and then I use that to create these large-scale negatives. And the negatives are done on this translucent paper, sort of like a chemistry lab. We're um, mixing chemicals to create um, basically photoemulsion. And then what's happening is that we're, we then take the, um, take the, the painting and sandwich it in between glass, and then it's exposed out into the sun. So I like to think of these as they're images of stars, but they're then printed by our closest star. Um, so here is, sorry guys, I have a film. Let's see how this goes. That was a, just a little process video um, that uh, shows how they're um, exposed out in the sun. This is an image of something that maybe some of you have seen on a t-shirt. How many of you know who Joy Division is? Many of us have seen this t-shirt but maybe don't know where this image comes from. It was a discovery by a woman named Jocelyn Bell Burnell of uh, Pulsars. Um, so this is the negative and the positive. You can see that they're direct replicants of each other. And so there's no camera being used. So it's a painting used to, um, then there's a kind of a secondary painting behind it, which is the, um, we black out the entire studio, cover the um, surface with photo emulsion, and then print it. So this is a plate of the Magellanic Clouds. They're nearby galaxies in the southern hemisphere. And it was, um, this is the negative, that's six feet by six feet, and it's positive. And um, this is, uh, gives you a better sense of the scale of this piece. And it was uh, Henrietta Eleven Swan, who discovered in the Magellanic Clouds um, luminosity variables. And from that, she was the one who figured out the distance of the universe. And um, we have all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, and Hubble was the one who discovered that the universe was expanding. And he was really standing on the shoulders of Henrietta Leavitt Swan with that um, incredible discovery. This is a painting of this very strange photograph of the women that was taken outside of, um, of the observatory. So many of the, um, the paintings themselves are um, linking just very specific discoveries of, um, of the different uh, astronomers. Many of the classification systems, if you've ever taken an astronomy class, you've probably heard um, the saying, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, right? 
hopefully. This is a way for you to remember the, um, the heat of different stars and the magnitudes also discovered by, and uh, the catalog was written by Annie Jump Cannon. Um, once this, there'll be um, several exhibitions of this work starting in Los Angeles in, um, in May, and the, then the show will travel to the East Coast, uh, New York and Delaware, and um, back to California for two exhibits. Um, there's another installation shot. And the last phase of this will be a, a publication. And um, one of the, you know, in the spirit of kind of interdisciplinarity, I've invited um, different authors of various disciplines, poets, scientists, um, and different authors to contribute to the catalog. And so we have um, two physicists, Dr. Jan Levin, who is the head of science at Pioneer Works, which is a really incredible interdisciplinary space in New York. Uh, Jennifer Ouellette, who works um, at Gizmodo as a... Um, as a science writer, Maria Popova, maybe some of you have read Brain Pickings. Um, really, if you're interested in the history and cultural impact of how science integrates into different disciplines, I would definitely look her up. Lisa Randall, who's a um, theoretical physicist at Harvard. And Davis Sobel, who um, is the author of Longitude, but Gal and, and also Galileo's daughter. Um, her and I met kind of accidentally through our research, and there's a new book that she's publishing coming out December 6th. Hopefully it will be on all of your Christmas lists to either buy for yourself or for, um, but buy for gifts. But it is um, called The Glass Universe. And um, she is writing the narrative and the history of these women at Harvard in the late 1800s. So look for that coming out very soon. And Dr. Anna Leahy is a, um, a poet at Chapman University. So the publication will not necessarily be a historical account of these women, but instead just offer almost like a recreation creation of the history of, um, of the different kind of passions and excitements about what astronomy can be in relation to, um, to these cyanotypes. Um, and you can see uh, more of the project, and I, there's a couple of different process videos on the website, so I invite you to, to take a look. All right, thank you so much.